my name is Richard Fur, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. Well, I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired thanks to Go Cloud Architects. It worked for me, and now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Go Cloud Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glow Cloud team. Welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about AWS versus Azure versus Google certification and all those critical things that are missing that you need to know. We'll talk about it from the perspective of a cloud architect or an enterprise architect. We'll talk about it from the perspective of a cloud engineer. We'll talk about the major gaps in knowledge as well as the things that are actually going to bias you to making bad decisions in your role as a cloud architect versus a cloud engineer. I am here today, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael Gibbs. I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Careers. I've been an IT architect for about 25, 26 years now as a network architect, an enterprise architect, a business architect, you name it, every kind of architect. I am joined here by Mark Milovanovich. He's a network architect. He's a Cisco certified internet expert, as am I. And he brings a wealth of network architecture experience. And I'm here with Alonzo Coleman, who's a cloud architect, who's also got an MBA uh, like me, but Alonzo is an expert in marketing. And he's an expert at building people's brands and really helping the world see them and their strengths. So we're going to talk about it today. We'll get into branding and where it's good, where it's not. We'll get into the skills gaps. We'll get into the skills. Before we do, I have to let you know this. Otherwise, my team will be sending me messages every 10 seconds. We have just launched our Artificial Intelligence Architect program. Uh, we've partnered with David Lithicum on it. Our how to get your hired strategy work and all the leadership skills, executive skills, business acumen, and David's deep knowledge of artificial intelligence. We're super excited about it. It launches on May 1st. And uh, right now, as part of the pre-launch, we've got 50% off. So take advantage of that. Incredible program. I'm so excited about it. Also want to let you know that we have a completely free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar on Thursday and a free ebook that's going to go with it. They're also going to be in the description of this video. My team will pop it in the chat boxes of on any platforms that we're on. And basically these free documents will tell you what we do in these roles. We'll talk about market demand. We'll talk about salaries. We'll talk about what hiring managers want in the perfect employee and what they don't want. So get this information and get yourselves hired. So we're going to talk about these certifications. And let's face it, I've been in tech for a while, and I still love certifications. I really do. And certifications do serve a purpose. They really do. They can help build your brand when used correctly. If used correctly, they can almost provide a framework for you to learn things, which won't be covered in the certifications, but things that you actually need to know to be good at the job. But And they can help you get an interview. Now, that is really exciting because how are you going to get hired without an interview? And, you know, part of getting these interviews is your brand, but some of it is certifications as well. So certifications do provide value. The problem is they don't provide the actual skills you need to do for most of these jobs. So we want you to get certifications, but at the same time, I want you to have the skills because employers hire you based upon skills. They don't hire you based upon certifications for the most part. 
Now, the Cisco Certified Internet Expert is actually an exception to that rule. And people buy the CC, get people, hire people with CCIEs because they're generally very competent. But also Cisco would give people a discount on their service, co service contracts if they had a CCIE. And when people called and said, hey, my systems are broken, if you had a CCIE on staff, you wouldn't have to deal with that first line tech support. Is it turned on? Is there paper in your printer? That kind of thing where you'd have to spend an hour and teach the first level tech support how to do their job. If you were a CCI or had CCIs on staff, if they ever open a case, it would go straight to the senior people where they had a good chance of helping you quickly and efficiently. So that's the exception of the rule. But let's talk about AWS certifications, Azure certifications, and Google certifications. And let's first talk about what it takes to get hired. You have to be able to do the job that you're applying for, and you have to be able to do it well. Okay? And... You've got to have the right attitude, energy, enthusiasm, and skills. But it has to be your job. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what AWS certifications do, or Azure certifications, or Google certifications. And I'm going to talk about where their gaps are. And then Mark's going to talk about it from a perspective of being a real hands-on tech professional, because Mark has been a lot closer to the tech than I have. I got out of engineering and architecture 25 years ago, and uh, let's face it, architects don't touch the tech. Mark's been in engineering until recently, been in architecture fairly recently, but he's great at his job. And Alonzo is going to look at us from the business perspective. Look, Alonzo went and did a whole bunch of certifications many years ago when he wanted to move into tech. He did a whole bunch of ridiculous cloud projects, which taught him systems administration and cloud engineering. And then he came to us, we trained him, we got him hired, and I begged Alonzo to come back and be part of the leadership team for our organization because he's got sort of good leadership skills. So let's talk about what's taught in an AWS certification, an Azure certification, or a Google certification. Typically the name of a proprietary service or the name of anything. So instead of teaching you what is a virtual machine and how a virtual machine works, They'll teach you that AWS calls it Elastic Compute Cloud, or Google calls it a Compute Engine instance, or Azure calls it an Azure Virtual Machine. Thankfully, they use a name that makes sense. And they'll teach you how to turn it on, meaning how to configure it, which is really wonderful if you're a cloud administrator that's going to turn these systems on. It's really wonderful if you're a cloud engineer that might do it. But what happens if you're an architect and you don't build anything? So let's take the difference between the cloud architect and the cloud engineer. The cloud architect is an executive that designs a solution to improve business performance. The cloud engineer is a builder, right? They're hands-on builders. Hmm. Big difference there. Big difference in skill set. So we have to make sure whatever training you get is relevant. So let's talk about what I do do as an architect. Here's what I do. I ask the client about the vision for the vision for their business. I learn the business processes. I evaluate their technology by bringing in a team of people to run an evaluation on it and leaving that team. I evaluate the organization's capabilities for change. I design a solution for them. I create an architecture team and lead that team. I have to present that solution to the client in a very persuasive way. I have to lean a team of people to respond to an RFI, RFP, RFQ, like a request for information, request for proposal, request for pricing. I have to help create a business case with an ROI model. I have to manage stakeholders. I have to manage vendors. I have to sell a solution. And I've got to work with uh, the C-suite in order to do any of this and get their buy-in and their support. And I have to write thought leadership documentation. That's the job of an architect. About the only thing I don't do is code it, configure it, or build it. None of it. It's not our job. So now we get an AWS Solutions Architect certification or an Azure Solutions Architect Expert or a Google Professional Cloud Architect certification, and they just taught me the name of these things and how to configure it. Uh-oh. I've learned every other skill other than the skills I need for my job. So let's back off out of the architecture role, and let's take and analyze something else. Here's the thing. If you do an AWS certification, it makes you think the whole world's AWS. We're going to use the AWS Content Delivery Network, the AWS Firewalls, the AWS databases, right? You've all been it. You've seen it. But 98% of organizations are multi-cloud. So I can't use any of those AWS databases or Azure databases or Google databases. I, 
I need enterprise grade security. So I'm not using any of that AWS, you know, WAF or the Google Cloud Armor, that kind of thing for basic systems. I need bigger industrial grade systems. So I'm going to go to the Palo Altos, the Cisco's, the Fortinet's, the checkpoints for security. Now I need a database that's going to work multi cloud. 98% of organizations are multi cloud. Get rid of that DynamoDB, get rid of that Amazon Aurora, get rid of that Google Cloud Big Table. Now we need things like MongoDB or Oracle, things that are going to work in all clouds. So they create this artificial environment, and there's that. So let's take a cloud engineer's role. What does the cloud engineer do? They build the designs of the cloud architect, and they optimize the performance of the systems they have. Now, in order to do that, the cloud engineer needs deep understanding of the systems. You can't optimize and performance tune what you don't understand, right? I mean, I'm not going to go try and increase the power of my Mercedes by going in there and doing something funny with the cylinders and putting weird fuel and oxygen ratios and do this stuff. I barely know how to turn or push the button on my car and drive it. And when it's time to get an oil change, I wouldn't even know how to begin to do that because I'm an architect and it's not part of my job. But, you know, that's the key. If I was going to performance tune my Mercedes, I'd have to know how the car works. I have to know how engines work. Now, what a good news is I'm an architect and I don't know that. So I know to find somebody that's good at it and they'll do it for me if that was my thing. But it's not my thing. I just need to take my wife to dinner and take my cat back and forth to places that she wants to the cat carrier. That's all I use my car for. But let's take that engineer. They need deep knowledge. So... They do an AWS certification. They click a few boxes on something as part of it. They learn the names of the service. Now, here's the problem. That cloud engineer is not going to be clicking on boxes in a management console like in the certification. They're going to be using the CLI, or better yet, they're going to be deploying infrastructure as code, something like Terraform. That's Terraform is not going to be covered in the AWS certification. It's a different certification, but it's still. Now, how about the systems administration? That cloud engineer is going to have to know how to use Windows, and they're going to have to know how to use Linux, because that's their job. But wait, that's not really covered in barely in AWS certifications or Azure certifications or Google certifications either. Hmm. Now that cloud engineer, not an architect, because they don't do any of this thing with hands-on, now that cloud engineer is going to need to automate, right? So they're going to read a need to read a Python script or a Bash script or a Windows PowerShell script. It's also not covered in a certification. So... You're starting to uh, what about Kubernetes? The cloud engineer is going to be working with that. That's almost nothing covered in the certifications either. So you're starting to see that these certifications give you some skills, but they're never going to be complete. For an architect, they're almost irrelevant. And I tell you, don't ever waste your time on a certification for an architect, but it's going to get you an interview. So that's worth something. So we'll keep it. And that engineer, those certifications do have value if you do it correctly. Now, Mark's gonna talk about how to use a certification as a framework and how to really learn what you need. And I'll add to that conversation with Mark, but Mark's an expert on these things. And Mark is about as techy as you ever wanna get. You wanna have a fun geeky day, get on a conversation with Mark and get deep on tech, and you will have fun. It's really fun. The rest of us will watch and eat popcorn, kind of like a movie. So kind of think about that. All so, right, Mark. <laughs> you know, All these right. are the things that we really want you to think about. You have to have skills. You have to have good, strong. So, and here's the last thing. People like to tell me, Mike, but if you don't do the hands-on labs, how are you going to learn how the technology works? And I always tell them that learning how to, the technology works has absolutely nothing to use with how to build it. Now, you don't have to believe me. I can promise you that nobody hires an airplane pilot to design a new airplane. I can also tell you that construction workers you know, the people that build things on the street or have a hammer and build your house or put new cabinets in your kitchen. Nobody asked them to design a thousand meter tall skyscraper or a shopping mall. And why is that? Because learning how to build doesn't teach you how to design. But I'm going to bring it all down to the tech. How many of you out there know how to use your computer? Or now to set up a Linux machine or to set up Windows? You've been hands on all day, all day, every day. Now, to be an architect, you need to understand how the systems design, design. Or even to be a good engineer, you need to understand how to performance tailing. So you need to understand where the strengths are, where the weaknesses, and how it works. Not how to build, but how it works. So for all you people that think you need to build stuff to learn how it works, how many of you have used your computer? I'm going to say you've all used the computer, right? You're probably using one to get here. So inside of your computer or server, there's a lot of parts. There's a motherboard or a main board where all the parts are snapped on. There's a CPU on there that does your computation. 
There's DRAM that takes information and feeds it to the, to the CPU. You've got a PCI bus that connects to your graphics cards. You've got NVMe interfaces that use the PCI bus, SATA, or SAS interfaces for your drives. So I'm asking you, you've used your computer. How many of you understand how your the CPU works? How do those cores work with each other? How do those cores hyperthread? What does the level one, level two, and level three cache do on your server? How many PCI lanes is on that CPU, and how does that affect your PCI cards that you might use for artificial intelligence or machine learning? Now, how is that pulling data from storage? whether it be NVMe storage or status storage, how do those protocols work along the way? And then you smack an operating system on your computer and the operating system has a kernel which manages memory and schedules tasks and prioritizes tasks. Now to be an architect, you need to know this because how else can you design a system? But for all of you that have worked on your PC every day for the last 20 years, do you know how any of that works? No, most likely most of you don't unless you've studied systems architecture. And systems architecture is the how things work and how things get put together. Not how to swing the hammer, not how to use that screwdriver, and not how to write code. So you've heard it from my perspective as a longtime architect and a longtime strategy consultant. But there is a way to do your AWS certifications as a framework. And Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about certifications from the perspective of a tech expert, being a heavy duty engineer like you've been in your life? So. Most certifications, when you look at them and you really pay attention to the language that they include, and I did this, just take a look at the AWS uh, solution professional. They, they have very fancy language that they use. And I say fancy when they use terms like design, describe, explain. And yet when you look at the actual training that's available for most of them, none of this is actually covered. A lot of it is just what is the service and what buttons do I need to smash just to get this to work? So from that perspective, you can say that the certification and the exam guideline guidelines themselves are very different compared to the training. So I would kind of decouple the actual training and the what the exam is asking from each other. And I would take the approach just like I would do with anything. I would try to figure out, number one, what type of job would I go for? And if that certification fits the type of job I'm going for, and we're talking about at least 10%, because you will never ever hit 100% with anything when it comes to being job ready, I would try to figure out what is it that I'm studying. Meaning, if I'm learning a particular service from AWS, let's say it's a transit gateway, my first intent should not be, how do I configure it? Because the configuration, generally speaking, and this, this goes across the board with any type of vendor with most kind of domains is trivial at best. But what is it and why would I use it? That's the first thing I try to find out. And that's something that, and take it from me, I've done numerous certifications. I've done it throughout the year, just like Mike, like the Lanza too. It's something you learn so late in your career on truly to look at it from that perspective. You're so focused on how do I just pass the exam? You're not focused on what is it that I'm learning? It's the journey. It truly is the journey. So the first thing is try to figure out why is it, what, what is it, and why do I use it? And then try to figure out at the level that they're asking you to learn it, if it's associate, associate, professional, professional, expert, expert, why is it there? Why did somebody who came up with this believe that I should know this at a fundamental level? And then I would read a little bit about it. And I know, Mike, you have the same, uh, same kind of process I do. I would read a page or two of whatever it is. And then I would read another 100, 150 pages just to make sure I understand the first, you know, couple of pages that I read. And and this is this is something very interesting because a lot of people don't don't teach you this. Why why is it that you're doing that? It's research. Yes. You, you you're trying to really to, and I, I know this is an overused word, but demystify. You're trying to take out the complexity, the abstraction of what is in the books, and trying to put it in a format that makes sense to you. Yes. And once you're able to do that, then eventually you can say, let's move on to a configuration piece. But we, we all, well, I don't want to say we all, but I, I know Mike and I, we many times have the discussion, how simple is it to turn on an OSPF process? It is, I mean, stupid simple. Router OSPF process ID one. And the rest of the process is on. And then it's a couple more commands and you got OSPF running. But the question is, what is OSPF? Why would you use it? What are links say advertisements? Why why are they there? 
Why would you have to throttle some of them? How does the flooding happen? Why do I have areas? What's the difference between a standard area and let's say a, a stop area, right? And you can transition that in anything with cloud as well, because cloud also has a lot of networking components, not just you know storage, database, so forth. How, wh why are they there? Why do I need to learn them? So that, believe it or not, all that what I just said is just the beginning of what you would do. So that's how I would approach it. Then the next thing, and we're still on one topic, then what I do, and I would recommend everybody do that as well, find problems. I mean, a genuinely research problems of what problems exist with this particular solution. If it's a, it's a, if it's a feature, if it's an entire protocol stack, find problems that come up with it. And then try to understand why that problem is there. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is really good for engineers. But let's say you don't have the hands-on or you don't want to do the hands-on. It's also a wonderful practice as an architect because it teaches you how a system actually works and why it works the way it does. So those are a couple of cheap methods, uh, <laughs> like, I, like I like to say. Um, I know, Mike, you've mentioned in the past, and I'll bring you in for a moment, and then I'm going to bring in Alonzo too. Uh, you've done the same thing, right? If I recall, where you would take the technology, you would not focus immediately on the actual hands-on, even though something like a CCA is really just hands-on. But you focused on one thing, research the heck out of it, and then try to find problems so that you can confirm your understanding. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. So let's say I was reading one of the routing TCP I books for Jeff Doyle. And let's say it had a 300 page chapter or 150, 200 page chapter on OSPF. That was a good start. So, you know, the first thing is they'd say OSPF is designed in RFC, whatever, whatever. So mm -hmm. I would go to the Internet Engineering Test Course and I would read the RFC. Then I would start to read the book and anything that I didn't know, I'd go look up which means by the time I'd read one page of a text heavy book, I probably looked up and found another 50 pages of things to read. Then I'd read the next page, go back and do something. Then, you know, at that point, I'd start to look at how and when would OSPF use? What is its strengths? What is its weaknesses? You know, this link state advertisements and this LSA is they're really hard to constrain. So, you know, is it going to be good for what types of environments? And then I would look at where OSPF would scale and how to make it scale and how to make it break. Like if the CPU gets too busy running that Digester algorithm. And then when I understood how it would break, and I might even try to break it myself, then I would try to figure out how to fix it and how to scale it. And by the time I was done with that 150 page chapter, I may have read 1500 pages or more. Honestly, it was going to be more than that. But at the end, I knew it. I knew it forever. And I kind of lived it, eved it, bred it, communicated it to my wife, communicated it to my brother. And, you know, my cardiology wife and my brother, who does electron, electro, electrical work, really had no interest, but they, get, they let me listen to them and they asked me questions about it to get better. So, yeah, I love the certifications as a framework, but, you know, you, uh, more the journey. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I always tell people this, what you're really doing is you're building a mind map. I, I yep. really subscribe to the idea of starting mm -hmm. with a big picture and then adding to that picture, because that's very mm -hmm. similar to how our brain works too. Our brain likes connections, likes yeah. to be able to attach information to what it what it already knows, because it tries to figure out, is this even important for me to, to know? Right. And sometimes you have to artificially create these kind of reasons for your brain to really keep track of it especially a lot of these certifications. And this is the part I genuinely dislike um, of this framework. When you take this approach, it's a lot of road memorization. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is counterproductive. It doesn't really do much. It might help you pass the exam at the end of the day. Yeah. But oh. if you really just look at it as, as a framework where you can tag on information yeah. and you move down the line when it comes to the actual information and then look at actually learning it, meaning that yeah. journey of going through it, that, that's where you get the most benefit from. Yeah, and, and it's true. And, you know, especially if we're in a role like a cloud architect or a network architect or an enterprise architect or an AI mm -hmm. architect, we're going to have to be working with all conceptual things. And, and that's why the architect role, the physician role, the attorney role, these kind of roles are paid so much because we're, we're dealing with things that you have to see in your mind you can't physically see. 
And you know, imagine if a doctor had to have a heart attack, a stroke, diabetes, cancer, blindness, deafness, liver failure, and limb amputations to know how to practice medicine. It's ridiculous. And it, it, it's funny, it, you know, when people say, but you haven't done that before. In fact, I remember being on my first architect interview like 25 years ago. And the manager says, have you done this? And I said, no, but I practice medicine. And I never had a heart attack either. And you know what? I've treated, treated a lot of diabetics and I've never had diabetes either. And I deal with people that have high blood pressure. And you know what? Thankfully, because I exercise, eat well, and have good genetics, I don't have high blood pressure either. But I've got a track record of people that I made better. Kind of looked at that and it was sort of there. And, you know, some things you just can't learn by doing. You just can't. You can't. You have to understand it. And, you know, architecture is, you know, this ethereal concept. You know, companies got this business process. This is how the sales thing works. This is the care and tech we have. In order to fix sales, we've got to enable our sales reps to do X, Y, and Z differently than they do today. What kind of technology is going to enable them to do that? It's not just the tech. The tech in itself, that's nothing. And, you know, it's kind of like my cat, Cindy. Everybody knows I love my cat. You know, my cat comes over. If she's happy, she lifts her tail up. She wags her tail sometimes when she's interested. But the cat's not moving. The tail's not moving. What if the tail was there and my cat was swinging side to side? You know, that's kind of like when when people deal will think about the tech and then figure out how to shove it in the business. Here, this, this thing's going to work. This is great. Here, let's just use it. And that's the problem. That's why 70% of technology projects fail for the most part. They fail to do anything other than work. Yeah, the tech worked, but like, so what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'll that's because I'm, I'm going to need Alonzo's opinion on this. Uh, people get certifications thinking it's a be-all, end-all, that kind of destination, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and yeah. it's quite interesting. I'm not going to name any vendor's name, but many times when you go on their websites, you'll notice under the certification, it will tell you what jobs you can get with the certification. Now, even though I have a CCIE, I always say I'm not an expert, but I've never ever been able to do any type of job any type of project any type of engagement purely based off certifications themselves no. and this is where reality really kicks you in the rear so to say is you got to understand that businesses are fluid they're going to have many different requirements many different necessities so when when we do these certifications that is just for something somebody thought at that level you should be able or capable of doing but guess what? Now that you go into a business, you are now outside the safe environment, something that's structured, something that might be considered best practices. And you go on into this business and you wonder, hey, how come we don't use a uh, direct connection gateway here? Why are we using just a transit gateway? Or why are we using, in this case, are we using OSPF, but I learned EIGRP in my certification? And that's where you start noticing is it's not all a one for one. A certification is really just there to provide you a means to gauge your competency to a certain degree yeah. or what you should be able to know. But yeah. if you take the approach like what Mike mentioned, and then just one second, Alonzo, and I'll get your take on it. And what I said, where you do that additional research, you actually then now grow beyond that certification and a little bit more confident for the job. Now, Alonzo, I'm curious with you. You've listened to us a little bit. I have seen... And I've been in situations where I've seen certifications not cover the whole breadth of jobs. Now, does it sound great to have a CCIE? Does it sound great to have an AWS professional or a Azure expert certification? Does that sound great from your perspective? Okay. There's some things to unpack here. So years ago, it's been about, what, almost six years that I show I wanted to jump into the cloud from a program management perspective. And back then, all they did was launch certifications. This is the standard. You got a certification, you got a job. You know, it was it was almost like a used car salesman twilight zone scenario where they just kept droning on and on and on. So I said, okay, I chose a specific cloud service provider. I'm going to keep it agnostic. And once I started jumping in and reading the white papers, and I can tell you there's not one white paper that I did not read. I'm 6'2", and it almost hit this, you know, it almost reached my height on how many white papers that I jumped on. And one of the things that I realized, there is no zero point of entry, period. You 
there's a grand assumption that you already are a part of the cloud. You already know how to configure cloud uh, uh, technologies. You already know what's under the hood. And so when I started reading, normally a how-to, you're able to go from page one to page two and so forth. Not here. I had to read. And the more I read, the more I didn't understand. So I had to just to get to one specific sentence and understand, I had to go back and research hours of what this stuff is, what it did, when you would use it, how does it sync up to here? What are you, what are the companies uh, putting, why are they putting this under the hood and so forth so that I can get an understanding of what one sentence was. So can you imagine how long it took? to look at all that information. So you're telling me one question turned into five questions, five turned into 10 as you kept digging and digging and digging, Exponentially, right? Exponentially, Mark. Yeah. It was just like, you know, it was so aggravating. So as I continually, you know, moving forward, as I continue to, to grow and learn, once I uh, met Mike, we had some real good discussions, my goodness. And the more I, uh, Mike shared the information that he knew, and as you know, as cliche as you mentioned, he demystified it. He broke it down. So comparatively, everything that took me six months, nine months to learn, I was able to knock it out in less than 30 days because he just shaved all of the, the extraneous, the superfluous, all of this down. It's like, this is what it is. This is what you do. This is how it works. This is what you would use and how you would use it. Lights came on, pennies were dropping. And from that point on, um, it helped me to look back at the certifications that I took. Now, it was it's interesting because how is it that with the certifications and what you learn, it seems to be a static approach to dynamic technology, yeah. apples to oranges. You're never it's like you you're standing in a in a riverbed and watching the current of technology, innovation, knowledge go right past you while you stand on this rock of certifications. It, it's incompatible. It just doesn't work. So as I move forward, I'm like, OK, this is not helpful. When I was able to apply it, it didn't make sense. Um, and it's really interesting because. How can I say this as when I realized I started off with a cloud service provider and the more I learned, the more I know I did not know anything. Yep. So I kept learning. And less and less of that value, it seemed to be less and less in the rearview mirror as I progressed down that river of knowledge. Another thing that I found was interesting is that with every question on the certifications that I had, it was specific to this cloud service provider. As we move forward, as everyone knows, multi um, uh, uh, hybrid multi-cloud is the name of the game. You don't want zero points of entry. You don't want vendor lock-in and tons of other reasons as to why you're not going to put all your eggs in one basket. And I'm like, okay, well, if this is all the questions and these are all the answers that go into the same source, this is not realistic, okay? So, and then on top of that, it did not teach me what BGP was. If I remember correctly, there was one, maybe two, questions in which the terminology included BGP. When I got the certification, I was elated. Yay, yay, yay. Now I'm, I have my zero point of entry. I got my chips in the game. I'm ready to do this thing. Uh-uh. So when Mike told me about BGP, told me about the protocols, told me, and the more I started learning, I said, I don't know anything, anything that anyone would want to hire me about. Okay certifications and as we mention all the time um if i'm going to a bank and i have tons of certifications doesn't mean that i know how to keep a job versus an offer letter where someone i have proven what i know i'm able to communicate it effectively to a point that they want me to work for them and they're willing to pay me x amount of sum of money so comparatively you already know you know which one to go for so at the end of the day it's the certifications, they're not what they're sold on. Um, they're not able to give you a job. It's able to kind of like put the frosting on the cake. It's a pretty bow on top of your overall competency of being a, a, a cloud architect or an enterprise architect, but it cannot speak for you wholesale. 
and you wouldn't want it to, especially coming from the position of one cloud service provider who will not give you a position on others because it's competition. So from that from that perspective of someone who did not start in the in the cloud or technology as a career and hasn't been there for decades at a time, I'm sure a lot of our audiences, you know, in in, in the crowd can understand where I'm coming from. So let's talk about the two kinds of certifications that actually exist. Some are actually designed to improve your salary and improve your skills. We'll talk about that. And some are actually created to make it easier for vendors to sell their equipment and to lower the salary of the people that are actually there. These certifications will increase your salary. The Cisco Certified Internet Expert, the Cisco Certified Design Expert, the CISSP, the CISM, and even to some degree, a TOGA. And what's special about these certifications? To pass the CCIE or CCDE, you have to know something. You just can't fake your way through a CCIE or a CCDE. You know, even if you spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on training, it's still not going to be enough unless you train. And you know, it's got. They have. You know, it's taken twenty years effectively, to, or twenty-five years to certify sixty-five thousand CCIEs, because ninety percent of the people fail. You have to be good for that. The CISSP, it covers all aspects of security, and it's a good tool for the security architect. How to quantify an organization's security risks, how to manage those risks, whether to transfer those risks or mitigate these risks or ignore the risks. It covers securing information. It covers you know, being able to analyze and see what's going on. It covers how to write a security policy. It covers security. And it's not tied to any vendor. And by doing so, it's kind of there to teach you the principles about a holistic security architecture. Same thing with the TOGAF. Here's what it is. How to approach your architecture is the same way to drive digital transformation, meaning start with the goals of the business, then evaluate the business processes, then evaluate the data, then evaluate the technology, then figure out governance solutions, figure out how you're going to design your solution, how you're going to document it, how you're going to manage your stakeholders. Whatever. So all that stuff is designed to make you good at the job. Now, let's pretend you're a vendor. Do you know how hard it is to go out there and sell, I've got the coolest technology in the world, and there's nobody that knows how to use it? Now, see, vendors know that there's a supply and demand curve, and when there's a huge demand of things like architects or AI architects or cloud architects or enterprise architects, and there's huge demand, and honestly, there's no supply, the salaries are quite high. But now look at what it takes to go flip burgers at a McDonald's, for example. It doesn't take a lot of skill. So there's a whole lot of people that can do the job. So the salaries are sadly low for the people in the skills. Now, let's look at this. If I can get a million or two or three million people AWS certified to do the hands-on doing stuff, the easy stuff, the hands-on doer stuff, I can turn those roles into technician roles and I can pay those people very little. So we can be very thankful that you know, it takes a lot to actually learn architecture. You can't learn it out of a certification. It has such comprehensive leadership and business acumen, sales skills, executive presence, emotional intelligence, that honestly, it's a job that aren't pays top five of all percent of salaries because you need those skills that an MBA would have and a technology strategist would have all rolled into one person. It makes, makes you a very rare bird, which is the perfect place to be in the supply and demand curve. And trust me, we've got lots and lots and lots of people that do really well, regardless of the background, because you just have to be good at the job. So we have to approach certifications as what's the goal of the certification? Is it to make your salary lower and make it easier for the vendor to be able to sell their stuff? Or is it designed to build your career? Now, I still don't I still want you to get certifications because it's about branding. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows until they communicate with you what you know or what you don't know. Now, I've gotten people like uh, Delroy Bat with zero certifications hired as a cloud security architect because he created really good content and he showed people he knew what he was doing. Or Robert Welch was someone we worked with. He had a cloud practitioner and got a massive cloud security architect job. But the world saw him as a security architect. We built him a good brand. He had a good profile and he had a great set of skills. So there's that. But it's still going to help you get out there. But we have to manage where we are in our career and where we want to. I like to see two or three professional certifications on someone's profile. And here's what I mean by two or three professional. 
associate certifications are almost ready to do the technician's job. Barely. So a so AWS Solutions Architect Associate is almost ready to do the technician work. An AWS Certified Solutions Architect Professional, you're probably able to do the cloud administration work, which is a the cross between a technician and an engineer. And that's good. Now, it's not going to make you an architect, but it's still going to show you know AWS stuff. And that's great, especially if you're going to work on AWS. So if you have a professional, whether it's an Azure Solutions Architect expert, again, they're all intro level, the AWS Solutions Architect professional, and it's intro level because it's teaching you intro level stuff, like how to build stuff. That doesn't mean the exam isn't going to be incredibly hard, but from a skill set that employers pay, it's all intro level stuff. But now you've got one of those professional. And honestly, they're relatively challenging to do. This is the exact opposite of the same of somebody else that in the same in the same time to do one professional can do three or four associate certifications. Almost ready to do a junior level technician's job in four different careers. Well, I'm sorry, I don't hire almost ready to do a junior level technician's job for anything. And I'm not impressed if someone almost knows how to do junior level work in four different people's careers. I can't use them for anything. So that one professional is worth those three or four associates. Now, if we can get it focused with two or three others, now we've got something. So I've got someone that wants to be a cloud security architect, and they've got that certified solutions architect professional. That shows me to some degree they know AWS stuff. Then they have a CISSP, which teaches me they know a lot about security. And then maybe they have a TOGAF or a CISM. Now I've got three hard certifications that the average person wouldn't do. And I have a belief internally, this person is probably going to know something until I meet them and ask them. And I might find out they do. I might find out they don't. But I'm also going to see that they're uncommon. And what do I mean uncommon? It's real easy to do eight or nine intra-level certifications with test guarantees that are out there. But it's pretty darn hard to do two or three good ones. So that shows me focus. And when I hire somebody, I want someone that's focused on the job. I mean, wouldn't you? You've got some construction around your house. You want in a new pool. Do you want that per person focused on putting in your pool? Or while they're there trying to put in your pool, they're playing with the rabbits, the squirrels, and the bobcats in the community. I've got a bobcat in my neighbor. He's really cute, but my nice cat city doesn't like it. That's neither here nor there. So, you know, I want my pool people digging my pool to build me a beautiful pool, not worried about wasting their time doing other stuff. So employers want focus. And in the process of getting, you know, a CISM, a CISSP and an AWS Solutions Architect Professional, maybe you have 40% of the skills that you actually need for the job because it's focused. Where if you did an AWS Developer Associate, DevOps Associate, SysOps Associate, Solution Architect Associate, and Cloud Practitioner, honestly, you don't have enough skills to do anything. And I'm not impressed. And I'm more concerned that you didn't figure out what your career is and you wasted your time on other stuff. And that's why sometimes it's better to remove a certification on your resume if it makes you look unfocused. So I want you to think about what you're doing at all times. How is it impacting your brand? How is it impacting how you'll be perceived? How is it impacting your absolute knowledge? Now, I'm going to ask Mark this question. I'm going to tell you my perspective. So the CCIE is the hardest exam in the world. Hardest. I had to read 75,000 pages of reading. I didn't have the benefit of online training when I was there. So it cost me almost $40,000 to achieve. It took me between six and nine months to do this. And my manager told me at my job, Mike, I need CCIEs on my team for a discount with Cisco. And he gave me four hours a day to work for my CCIE. So here's what I did in those six to nine months. Actually, it was about eight months. I used to wake up at uh, five o'clock in the morning so I could study from five to eight. Between eight and 8.15, I ate breakfast. And between 8.15 and nine o'clock, I drove to work. I worked roughly the first four hours of the day with a, and, and I'd skip lunch. And that would get me till 1 p.m. And then I would eat lunch and I would practice from 1 to 6 p.m. at my desk. I would do CCI reading, CCI labs. Then I would get home around 6.30. I ate with my wife. And then from 7 to 10 p.m. at night, I did more CCI reading. That was Monday through Friday. On Saturday, I would rent a rack from CC Boot Camp. It was $200 a day at the time. And, that, and I was going to maximize my $200 a day. So at 9 a.m., I got on that rack, and I stayed on that rack until 11 p.m. at night. And I did this every week for eight months straight. Now, I got to tell you, when I started this whole journey, and I did that CCNA first, oh, this networking thing's pretty easy. 
-hmm. And then I did my CCNP next. It was this 10 day $11,000 boot camp. When I finished that, I realized, you know, honestly, I didn't know a lot, but you know, I think I know something now, but there's a little more of this networking thing than I thought. And then after studying, literally speaking, roughly 10 hours a day for eight months straight, I realized I knew absolutely nothing by the time I finished my CCI exam. And I was going to have to learn forever that that was my intro level. So, you know, Mark, you know, what did you learn along the way? How did you feel about your CCI? Because you did it. All right. I'll, I'll start off with this way. It wasn't for you. Yeah. So let me start off with this. So when you described that when you were done with it, you found out how little you actually knew. <laughs> the <This> irony. Is, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's sort of embarrassing telling people, you know, once you've done something like that, because everybody, you know, the, the, the word expert is in the title. So the assumption, you know, everybody makes assumptions what expert means. I don't consider self an expert because an expert to me is somebody who knows anything and everything about the subject. So I've never met any CCIE that knows everything and anything, even about the certification, if it's routing and switching, if it's data center, that knew it all. I mean, drop out of head. I never met somebody. But this this was my experience. I looked at it like climbing a mountain, a mountain that I had no business climbing. That's how <laughs> I felt. Once I got to the top, I bend over my you know my knees and I'm huffing and puffing. I finally got my results. I passed. I was elated. Then I made the mistake and I looked up. I was only on one mountain peak. And out on the horizon, there were 50,000 more peaks. <laughs> and that's what the CCIE taught me, how little I do truly know. Yeah. So I, I just like you, I spent a ridiculous amount of time. Days turn into weeks, turn into months, turn into, for me, it was a little bit over a year. I, I didn't really know how time worked anymore, because it just kind of swam all <laughs> in between it, mm -hmm. uh, between working full time, having to do a few hours before the job, after the job on the weekdays, just to kind of general reading theory. They'd even try laughing during the week because that wouldn't have worked out. Uh, trying to have these Cisco dreams and DMVPN and L3 VPN kind of dreams, OSPF. I mean, I saw backbone areas in my dream uh, when it came to the weekend. That's why it was what we call it lab day, which basically mm -hmm. meant you locked yourself in a room. And if it was a multi topology type of day where you took all types of different protocols and meshed them all together, you know, that was a minimum eight hours. So I worked really heavy on my carpal tunnel during those times. <laughs> and uh, there really was no difference even when it was technology based, right? Because you would sit there and aside from bathroom breaks and the general let me let me shove something down my my throat just for some sustenance it i'm not exaggerating it was um a good i would say at least eight nine hours maybe not all at once but eight nine hour days on the weekends just labbing and that went on for like i said for a little bit over a year uh it is one yeah you know what it is it's it's almost like and i don't want nobody to take this in the wrong way i'm just going to use that analogy so you know, don't take it like I'm trying to say anything else, but it is almost like self-inflicted torture after a while because you um, you sort of deprive yourself from all these things that make you human yep. to be able to accomplish it, right? Uh, you can't do this without any support from your family. If you have wife, if you got children, I mean, that there's no way if they don't support you that you cannot do this because of the time investment that it takes. And just like, you know, Mike mentioned, I also had the pleasure of my wife. She would listen to me babble on about this technology. She probably knows MQLS better than most engineers, even though she's not an engineer. Uh, you know, she's heard SD-WAN so many times. She'll, she'll explain it to somebody who doesn't. Uh, she's turned around, become tech support just by listening to me. Uh, <laughs> that shows you just the, 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 the depth that you have to go in. But the, the real key to something like the CCA is, and I want everybody to take this, it takes a lot of work. You have to be, 
I think a little obsessive to even want to approach that and a little bit cuckoo because of what it will take for you to go through it. It is not one of these certifications. And I'm not trying to take away from any other certification, but this no. is definitely not one of those certifications that you decide just to do on a whim. Yeah. There's a difference between, hey, let me tackle an associate compared to a professional, compared to a expert level. Because yeah. you gotta you gotta remember this. Certifications, unlike our jobs, they're narrow, they're strategic. Yeah. But narrow and strategic within a certain depth. As you move up in that depth into that in those different domains, the time that you'll have to spend on it is going to go up, right? And that's why it's so key that if you're even going to bother doing these things, do them the right way so that you gain the most out of it from a learning perspective and then what you can brand and what you can apply at the job. That's what I would say key. And when I say is to brand yourself is if nobody knows what that certification is, like in my case, I had plenty of people, even customers. I mean, I had to spell CCIE from them. They had no <laughs> clue what it means. It has it has zero value to them, right? So for that customer, all that mattered was the, the results I could deliver. Yep. Right? For some stakeholders, it was the same thing. Because like, oh, yeah, so yeah, you got a certification. How nice. Great. Then among different people, among peers, it was almost like your God level. So again, pick the right certification, go through the process the right way. And if you decide to do something like what Mike and I did, and you want to put yourself through some self-inflicted torture and deprive yourself <laughs> of basic human needs at times, do the CCIE. Because again, the CCIE, I would say is one of those few certification. It's not just the, the depth that you go into it. Yeah. A lot of the skills that most certifications don't teach you, and I'm not saying the CCA teaches you, but indirectly you have to learn. You have to learn how to be organized, plan your day. You'll have to start thinking more strategic on when and how you do certain things. So, and then you got to learn how to go through problems, how to work through these problems, how to deal with them. And interestingly enough, these are some skills you will be applying to yeah. as either a senior level engineer or architect because you're going to be working with customers and working through their pain points as well. Yeah. So I know that was a little long winded, but that that was quote unquote my CCA experience. And uh, I give credit for any, and I mean, there's anyone who decided to do two, three or four of them. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. And, 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 you know, and I'll ask, answer Mr. Dominic's question and then I'll give you my perspective on the CCA as well as building your career. So, Mr. Dominic, you asked the CCI by comparison to the AWS Solutions Architect Professional. You can put the AWS Solutions Architect Professional, all of it, in 500 pages of reading. It's about 75,000 pages of reading to do the CCIE. So I would say it's about 150 times harder to do the CCIE. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do the CCIE, you'll have the skills for a network engineering job in 90% of the cases. When you finish an AWS Solutions Architect Professional, quite honestly, you won't be ready to do anything. Now, it's not that it's an easy exam. It's not. AWS asks questions in a very wordy manner, but it's nothing by comparison. I'll tell you, I did the Google Professional Cloud Architect. Now, admittedly, Mr. Dominic, I learned faster than a normal bear. I come from medicine. I spent 16 hours preparing for the Google Professional Cloud Architect and obviously passed it. I spent eight months at 10 to 12 hours a day for the CCIA. And that's at my learning speed, but we all learn in a different yeah. manner. So here's the way I saw the CCIA, but Quite honestly, here's the way I see being great at anything. I can't explain why, but my wife, you know, she's got an IQ of 170. She learned Spanish in 10 days because her translators couldn't understand our thoughts. She's incredible at cardiology. And, you know, she's got this obsession with Miley Cyrus. I mean, everywhere I turn around, there's a Miley Cyrus song. And, you know, the CCIE reminds me of the song, The Climb, where Miley says, there's always going to be another mountain. I'm always going to want to make it move always going to be an uphill battle. Sometimes I'm going to have to lose. Ain't about how fast I get there. Ain't about what's wait, it's ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's the climb. And that's really the key, what we're really talking about. That climb with that journey. What are you learning? It's a whole journey. You're going to get better every day for the rest of your life. I promise you, if you try, if you apply yourself, you're always going to get better. So 
you know, the AWS solution architect professional might be 2% of what you need to know to be a great cloud architect. I need you to learn that other 98% over the course of your life. And realize that these are just a starting point. Even the CCI is intro level. And it sounds like a lot. And believe me, it is a lot. It's a whole lot. But, you know, it's kind of what I didn't realize until I became the CCI is that's just the ticket to the big work, the hard work, the challenging work. As soon as I had the CCA, the big bank was like, oh, wow, we got this project nobody's ever been able to figure out for the last three years. Go figure it out. I'm like, I'm like, huh? I'm like, how many people have worked on this for the last 33 years? Oh, about 40. Nobody's been able to figure it out. But you're a CCI, you can. And then it was like, <laughs> okay, uh-oh. Now, what do I do? Now, the good news is I know that for all of you, if you take a big problem and break it down into many smaller problems, it'll be much easier to solve. And the CCIE taught me how to learn real, real fast, almost as fast as when I learned how to practice internal medicine. The CCIE taught me how to find the right information and separate good information from the garbage that you see out there. And 90% of the garbage, the information you see out there is garbage. Here's a secret. If somebody's writing content for you and they're not a principal architect or a distinguished architect, chances are they don't even know how they got there. And they're going to write things that are inaccurate. But if they're a principal architect at Microsoft or, or a lead architect at Cisco or IBM or something like this, you're going to actually get some quality information. So I hope I answered you to that. So now let's take it back to the architect world and the engineering world, right? These are two different careers. And we basically said that the certification doesn't really teach you that much of what you need. So let's think about it. I want to go back to what we do with architects. We design a solution to improve our business, our client's business performance, which means we need to ask the executives about the goal for their business. That means as architects, whether you train with us or you go take a $5,000 CXO relevancy class, you need to understand CXO relevancy, which is the skills to communicate to the C-suite. Now, our jobs as architects is to optimize our client's business performance. We have to. That's our whole job. So... You know, if you train with us, great. And if you don't, go get a master's in business and learn about business and learn about business process re-engineering because you need to know it. Okay. You have to assess the organization's capability for change. Can they, can, they, can they change? Are they willing to change? Will the people adopt the change? Can you get an executive buy-in? Can they manage the new technology or handle it? So obviously we train you, but if not, make sure you learn about change management from somewhere or we'll go take some change management consulting training. We have to lead an architecture team. We don't design an architecture ourselves. You know, I design an architecture, chances are it's gonna have an AI architect, it's gonna have a data scientist, some security architects, some network architect, because if I'm focusing on the whole architecture, I can't be focusing on the networking, some big data architects, you name it, I am architects. So in order to lead a team of architects, you're gonna to have to sell them for the goal to work with you and you're gonna to have to have some pretty good leadership skills. So make sure you learn to sell from somewhere, take some sales training, we train it obviously, but make sure you get it. You know, you're gonna to have to know how to respond to an RFI, RFP, RFQ in an executive manner. We teach it, if not, go figure out how to write some proposals and respond for proposals and get people to be willing to purchase your responses. Because otherwise you're gonna fail out of that job in a, in a heartbeat. You don't wanna get a job and get fired as soon as you get there. You wanna get promoted, right? Now, you know, I've designed a lot of billion dollar technology solutions as a cloud architect, enterprise architect, AI architect, you're gonna be designing solutions all the time. But nobody's gonna to wanna to buy it unless you can build them a business case with an ROI model, something that shows them they're gonna achieve more than it's cost. So obviously we train this, but if you're not with us, go get some training on ROI modeling and some of that, most of that will actually thankfully be covered in an MBA. Now we have to do a whole lot of stakeholder management. And I gotta tell you, Managing stakeholders across departments is like managing a, a kitten, a lion, a German shepherd, a golden retriever, a panda bear, a goat, a sheep, and a cow all in the same house. I promise you, it's a very big challenge. So make sure you get some specialty stakeholder management training. Of course, we teach it, but, you know, this is very soft-handed, you know, Robert Caldini kind of persuasion, ethical persuasion, and ethical influence of people. Now... We're gonna to have to manage vendors. And believe me, those vendors are like cats running around on their own direction that all wanna get paid to sell you something. So we're gonna to have to figure out how to get and cut through the weeds, cut through the BS with all the vendors. 
And the reality is we're going to have to do a lot of executive writing and we're going to be writing for executives, whether they be proposals, architecture documents, writing thought leadership documents, white papers. So if you're not with us, if you're out there, you'll get it. If you're not with us, make sure that you get some executive writing training. And those are going to be the skills that you need. And make sure you get networking, data center, and cloud knowledge, how the stuff works and how to put the pieces of parts together, not how to build. Now, that's for the architecture stuff. But what about those cloud engineers? You're not going to just get it by uh, passing some certification and doing some AWS cloud projects and open a Git page. First, your manager is not going to be looking at your Git page anyway. They don't care. I promise you they don't care. But that's neither here nor there. You've got to know something. So if you want to be an engineer, I don't care if you can set up an EC2 instance on AWS. I taught a six-year-old how to do it in five minutes. But I do care if you understand servers and server virtualization and process our architecture and operating systems and kernels and the such. So if you're going to be an engineer, go buy yourself a server, something with 16 to 24 cores and a minimum of 120 gigs of RAM in it and some NVMe drives or a rate or a rate array of, say, SSD drives and put a hypervisor on there and build yourself some virtual machines and build your virtual machines with various core sizes. And if you're that engineer, push a PCIe card like a GPU into that virtual machine. Push a physical network card into a virtual machine with like single IO root virtualization. Build these virtual machines. Create a network of your virtual machines. Use one virtual machine to hack into another one. Create some file shares on these virtual machines. Learn to do it the hard way. So when you go to the cloud, everything's pre-done for you, which means you can literally be configuring stuff all day and le learn anything. But you get a server. You virtualize that server for the engineers, not the architects, the engineers. And on that server, you build your file servers and you build your LAMP stacks and maybe you build a VPN concentrator. And maybe you build a virtual network and maybe you set up the bird routing daemon on some Linux systems. And maybe you set up some BGP. Maybe you build yourself a proxy server. Maybe you build, you see what I'm saying is build all the stuff and go work with the stuff. And by doing so, and by doing it at the elemental level, on that physical server, that bare metal, you're going to learn much more about how those systems interact with the hardware. And then when you're dealing with the client that's got 3,000 VMs and they're trying to determine out whether they go with a hypervisor or a container or, or, or a virtual machine and you truly know the difference because you've gotten that, and hands-on at the elemental level is a whole lot different than clicking a bunch of boxes on the cloud. You're going to actually understand it. And then if you're an engineer, Make sure you learn those engineering skills, like Python for engineers, or Bash shell scripting in Linux for engineers. And if you're an engineer, go build your Linux servers. Build them the hard way. Start with basically a kernel and then add your packages along the way and truly learn how Linux works. And if you want to be a cloud engineer, go build yourself an Active Directory server from scratch and set up those Active Directory trusts and federate your Active Directory server with an identity provider like LinkedIn or Yahoo or Google. But really learn how the stuff works. And while you're at it, stick a protocol analyzer like Wireshark and look at the packages that go there. Build yourselves a virtual machine. Build your, for your security for your engineers, a security engineer. Build a bunch of virtual machines. Set up another virtual machine with Kali Linux and go hack into these things. But see, that's the thing. you got to get deep on your skills and they're not covered in certification so understand this realize you, you mind if i add something mike just for yeah, a moment please to, to please give people all the idea i'm a big proponent even for architects to look for problems within a solution because yep. that generally speaking gives you good learning uh ability uh, not ability gives you some learning curve uh, when it comes to the engineer though what you'll notice is once you start building the solution especially at the very beginning when you know very little about it, you're gonna be making so many mistakes. You're gonna be creating so many of your own problems <laughs> that you will have to go through the process of actually researching what you just did wrong, right? Yep. It, it could be as simple as, you know what? I forgot to turn up an interface. Or at some point you might be challenged with the idea about, uh, you know, the virtual machine that I'm trying to run. Maybe I really didn't understand how how to actually uh, provision the virtual course appropriately. Maybe I had it all mixed up. Maybe I didn't understand that at first. How does storage fit into it? 
well, I just picked a, a particular power virtual driver. What did that really do? Yeah. Right. So as you as you try to build it yourself and you start going through those problems, that's where you start researching. That's where you start really understanding why it works. And by the time you actually get to go and test what you really wanted to work on, you would have learned like 50 other things because of going through the process of trying to build the solution. Now, for architects, I just you read the use case and read the problems that might come up with this. That, that's what I generally say. <laughs> but for engineers, definitely get your hands dirty because it teaches you troubleshooting as well. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be yeah. core and a key uh, skill when it comes to that. It's also not taught in certifications, just so everybody understands. Yeah. These skills are not taught. Yeah, and they're not going to be taught because this is real world work. Mm-hmm. I remember the certifications are very narrow for the most part. How do I create a technician that I can create millions of them? Yep. And by millions of them, I can sell my solution to the client and it's not going to be expensive. So here's the key. If you know that they are really designed to create commodity technology professionals, here's commodity coffee. It's not real expensive. Here's a rare commodity diamonds. You want to be diamonds or do you want to be coffee? Personally, I want to be diamonds. I want to go out there, be seen as the best, have the shine of a diamond, get paid like a diamond, and then go home, take good care of my wife, my family, my in-laws, my cat, and you know, be able to do some of the things that I do on a charitable basis because I like that. It makes me feel good. It's really what I'm kind of be there. So I kind of hope these things make sense. We're not saying don't get certifications. We're saying understand the weaknesses in them. And because you understand the weaknesses in them, don't make them the basis of your training. Make them a framework for your training and make them a branding tool. And then seriously focus on being really great at your skills. People pay people for the because they need work to be done. And the better you are, And honestly, it's not just the better you are. It's the perceived value of what you are and what you can offer others. I I want to give you guys a little bit, uh, sorry, Mike, just a little bit added, uh, like behind the scenes. And I know Mike's been there as well. When when you're trying to figure out the requirements to bring on board a new person, the reason we go for certifications is because we're making the assumption you know what's included in that. It's a quick way of us to know that you have this competency instead of us writing a, you know, 50 line bullet list of the things we would want. It's the same idea when when they list communication skills. How do you test for communication skills, right? So it's through the interview process where you start getting into understanding how a person talks, how to communicate certain things. Whatever they mention, if they have a certification, that is going to be fair game for you to in a nice way. I generally like to probe in a nice way and then kind of tie that back to another skill to see, do they feel comfortable talking about a certain technology? Not necessarily in a sense, explain to me how you configure it, that's gonna be irrelevant, but rather, what is it that that person took away from it? That's where certifications really come in. But again, they're just another tool, even for a hiring manager to kind of weed out those that they don't perceive immediately You know, to have yeah. those kind of skills right that's why generally certification the right one for that job because that's going to vary per job which one you get and if you have experience again experience with certifications are better just like uh, certifications with experience is better than any of them by themselves like if somebody came and just said they had 20 years of experience but then ever have a bother to do a certification i might ask them why not Maybe they never needed to. I don't know. If some person has five certifications but has zero years of experience, I might wonder what happened there. Yeah. So, and, and it's all about can they do the job? You know, look, in our yeah. training, we get into very complicated situations and scenarios just like the real world. But it, and I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not opposed to certification training. Mm-hmm. I'm opposed for using it incorrectly. So the key is whatever you do, Make sure you learn the skills. The same things here with cloud projects. You know, I came out of retirement to create this cloud architect program because I saw the weaknesses in certifications. I actually interviewed a thousand AWS certified people, and honestly, very few even knew that EC2 was a virtual machine. 
None of them knew what had any idea what cloud computing even was. None of them understood how to solve any business problems with technology. They just didn't. Unless they had previous jobs as security engineers or architects, they didn't understand system security. They basically were just how to, how to, how to. But unfortunately, any of these jobs are not these high paid jobs. They're not really at that how to level. They're either at the performance tuning level and the uh, making the stuff work and being a deep technical expert like the engineer, or they're the architect where we're focusing on the business side of these things. So kind of think about that. So we'll get to questions in about a minute or two. If you've got questions, please ask them because we'd love to do it. If we see a lot of questions, we'll get to the questions sooner. I see the few that are there. But you know, please get your free how to get your first cloud architect job guide and you know, join us on Thursday. And uh, on Thursday, what we can do is we can, uh, realistically speaking, we can talk about the role, go every skill that you'll actually need inside of these sort of, and, and we can cover, you know, we can ask you questions. We'll talk about how to skip those pesky HR people and internal recruiters that ought to reject you. So you can go present your case to the, the hiring manager and we'll, we'll cover it all and it's all gonna be free. So join us, it'll be on Zoom and we can have a conversation. But really that's the key get great at your job. And the same thing goes with cloud projects. You know, years ago, we told people that certifications wouldn't get anybody hired. And then people got certification, certification, certification. Yeah. And, you know, we actually looked at all the certification providers courses and most of them had no idea what architecture was or any of these roles, but they were mm -hmm. crazy courses. And, you know, we talked about everybody not getting hired and guess what? Everybody got certified. They didn't get hired. They came to us. We retrained them so many of these people have gotten hired at all these great companies. But then they said, oh, let's have people do cloud projects. Now, here's the problem. The people that are creating the cloud projects don't know what an architect is either, because they've never been one. And let's say that you want to be an airplane pilot, and you've been a flight attendant for 10 years, and now you go to flight school and become an airplane pilot, and you're trying to convince that hiring manager over at, say, United Airlines, that you're an expert flight attendant, and that's why they should hire you to be a pilot. Now, the reality is being a flight attendant might actually hurt you when they want a pilot because they want a pilot, not a flight attendant. But they're just not going to be impressed. So now I need an architect that can design a solution to improve business performance. They can give a C-suite presentation. They can lead a large team that can optimize business processes. They can negotiate a deal. And someone's telling me that they can configure Linux because they did a cloud project on Linux. Well, that's great that they did a project in someone else's job. It's like a flight attendant trying to say, I've got years as a flight attendant instead of talking about the flight school that they went to and how they learned to fly and how they learned how to deal with inclement weather. And because they were trained by a Marine Corps fighter pilot, they learned actually how to deal with bad situations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all the good stuff that makes them hireable. So let's get to some questions. Ah, from Sagar. I have one question. Do you cover complex or varieties of real-time scenarios of solutions architects in paid cloud architect program? In our program, we cover the exact real world. We, in, in two of the three classes, we design architectures. Either it's an architecture project where the students are given a business case and an RFP, and they can ask the client's executives about their business. And they typically ask a CEO and potentially a CIO. They will divide themselves into architecture teams. They will design the architectures. And then they will present the architectures back to us and try to sell it to us just like in the real world. And we'll give them. We will have our students work on presentation skills, sales skills, executive presence. Our students will work on situations for banks, internet service providers, healthcare organizations, social media providers, retail enterprises, global enterprises, and exactly what they would do in the real world. Can't have an architecture program that, I mean, a real one that isn't teaching actual architecture work. So we get very deep in our architectures and our students do everything that they would do in the job. Now, we don't just have those live classes, which we have three live classes a week, two focused on tech, one focused on business. But our students also do work. They train for their resume. They train how to create a LinkedIn profile. They do practice interview questions. They practice on each, uh, on, on, they work on LinkedIn and resume training. They work on their business acumen, their leadership skills, their sales skills, their executive presence, their emotional intelligence. 
They learn AWS, they learn Azure, they learn Google. We do multi-cloud architectures, hybrid cloud architectures, private clouds. My students design and build private clouds. So we get really, really heavy cigar in what we actually do for the job. Great question, by the way. We don't have to, I'm happy to answer more. Do you mind if I add something to that, Mike? Please, Mark. I, I generally stay away a little bit more from the sales and presentation side, even though that, <laughs> yeah. that is also very fun to be part of. But uh, and this is for everybody listening, then eventually for the recording. There is no such thing as a complete architecture training program. It, it, that, it didn't really exist. Let's put it that way. Uh, a lot of the certifications, as we mentioned, that are out there, they're implementation and service-based. So they're just going to teach you how to configure it. Uh, depending on the type of trainer you may have, they might give you some additional value in helping you understand how a technology works and maybe a use case or two. So what, what is really unique here with us is all these gaps that we've been discussing that you have on these certifications, they're also present on architecture certification, something like the Zachman framework certification, the TOGA, that is basically devoid of any technology, how it actually works. It's all processes in a sense. What makes our approach unique is that you get everything in one package if you're willing to work for it. So you'll get your technology training, you'll get your architecture training, just like Mike mentions when we have the projects, you'll actually have to put yourself in the role of the architect, lead a team, have the different team members involved with you. But then when you go to the action technology, the depth might vary depending on what it is, but you still learn how, what is the technology? How does it work? Why would you use it? It may be networking, security, cloud, storage, compute, you mentioned it. But then the additional other skills again come in to kind of close that gap in regards to your presentation. How do you present something? What are some of the ways that you can learn to excel in your sales skills? Then of course, communication and writing, that's always gonna be at the forefront of what most people do as architects. And again, when we speak architecture, we speak the business side of an architecture. We're not discussing what AWS sells you or uh, Microsoft or Google, where you're more of a hybrid type of engineer and architect where you'll need to know how to actually do the configuration and then based on a scenario within that solution, how to apply and design it. So I just want to put that out there. That is going to be my sales pitch. Aside from that, I love to answer technology questions otherwise. <laughs> I just want to add that. Uh, I know it sounds biased, but it is an unbiased view. Trust me, it doesn't exist out there, a complete package such as this. No. Back to basics. I have a two-hour interview for a solutions architect. The basics are I will have to design and implement a solution to improve business performance. Could you do a role play to show a model answer? I'm trying to see if I can understand that. Was there another version of the same question that I can answer and then probably do this as a second question after the fact? Because I think he actually asked two questions. One would be a more technical solution. One would be a more business-oriented solution. Okay. Can you give an example of how to present and design a solutions for cloud interview questions? Well, here's the issue. First thing I need to do is spend at least 45 minutes to an hour asking questions, learning it, and then giving a response. So maybe... Let's talk about, I'll give you a situation and we can look at a, a, an opportunity or two. So if Mark were to ask me or Mark were to say to me, Mike, I need a solution for a global enterprise. It's a bank and one minute of downtime to them costs $10 million per minute. We need to create a network that can self heal within 40 milliseconds at the same time we need to have layer three security and the ability to create access lists between subnets and filter routes and filter things. If Mark were to ask me, how could you design something like this? I'd probably ask a question, Mark, what's your interior gateway protocol? And Mark would tell me it's OSPF. Now, Mark, is it a single area or multi-area? In this case, it's a single area. Okay, wonderful, Mark. It's a signal area that's going to really help us over here. Mark, uh, what kind of backbone do you actually have right now and kind of bandwidth between your core routers and core switches? Uh, they're actually going to be 100 gig links, and we actually use an MPLS as our transport mechanism. Okay, great. Oh, you mean MPLS is a transport mechanism into the network between data centers. Is that correct? That's correct. Our core, our core is the device of MPLS and OSPF. 
So we have the IGP to our loss reachability to our loopback addresses and MPLS for the action transport. And then at the edges, we do run BGP for the uh, reachability information to be advertised in and out of our domain. Okay, Mark, are you running TDP or LDP as your MPLS switching protocol? Well, in this case, we're actually running LDP, but depending on what you tell us, I we are curious to find out if it might be more advantageous to get rid of LDP and go towards more of the segment routing so that we can just utilize our IGP2 for the laboring. So that would be up to what you figure out. Okay, fantastic. Are you doing anything with explicit paths currently? No, we're not. No explicit path, no path constraint, nothing like that. Okay, great. So, Mark, I love it. You already have an MPLS-enabled backbone. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a position where we can figure out how we can traffic engineer. You know, what we could do is we could create two layer two tunnels, but basically the Luca Martini draft that was integrated into which we now use for VPLS and other things. Perfect. And what we could do is how much, what's the minimum bandwidth you need for these tunnels between point A to point B? Well, since we have the 100 gigs in the infrastructure, uh, I would like to say that we at least want to be able to utilize about 60 to 65% of them. And then the rest, we can always leave up for a little headroom. And then, of course, anywhere from 5 to 10% for just up to control plane traffic. Okay, that's great. So, Mark, what we can do is we can use RSVP signaling. We can, make, we can signal okay. to make sure that there is 60 gigs of available bandwidth. And what we'll do is we'll create a primary tunnel and we'll create a backup tunnel. Now, what we'll do is we'll take two, we'll create two MPLS explicit paths. And explicit path one will utilize a, a primary path that we know about, and we're going to guarantee that that gives us 60 gigs at all time. We'll also create that backup tunnel, which will signal over a secondary MPLS explicit path over routers and switches that are not in the same path. By doing so, RSVP is very quick, and the way that it signals is the bandwidth available and gets a response. Should we have a cable cut or we have any kind of kind of constraints where we lose a link, MPLS fast reroute will enable us to reroute our traffic over the second tunnel within 40 milliseconds. So back That's to basics, sense. what did I do here? I had to have all the information to even know where to begin. And without knowing where to begin, there's that. So why did I pick networking? Because Mark is a network architect and I knew Mark could go very deep into networking without me prepping him for the thing. Now, if Mark was a chief information officer, I would ask him the questions about his business. I would ask him, you know, what the business goals are. I would ask how their business works today, works, works. I would ask about the business processes. I would then evaluate, ask what current technology. I would ask what's working. I would ask what's not working. I would look for current as builds or how the systems I build, graphics. And then I would go back and I'd work backwards from the business goals and I'd do a gap analysis between what they have and what they need. And then I would create my strategy and present it. So two thirds of what the issue really is here, back to basics, is finding out the actual challenge, finding out the goal that they have, figuring out what they've done and what doesn't done. Because when I asked Mark what his interior gateway protocol is, and he said OSPF, now if he said it's EIGRP, I couldn't do any of this. I'd literally have to replace EIGRP with OSPF or intermediate systems, intermediate systems. Now, I had asked him if it was all in a single area or multi-area. If it was multi-area, we'd have to re-architect his network before we could even think about creating this MPLS-enabled backbone because we would need all those LSAs, which you'd have to know networking to know, but I had to get this information before I can design it. So I hope I answered your question there, Back to Basics. If not, you know, feel free to ask another one. And, and I'll probably add this to it. If you're having this based on an interview, you're not going to have the luxury of doing what Mike just did or a real architect would anyway do, and that's go to the specific people that would give you that information. Uh, in real world, you'll have to go to a security architect, security engineer to get the security posture of the company. You might then have to go to the networking site and get that. And then in regards to the processes, you may actually have to go to human resources and other people within that, uh, what is called the service delivery aspect of uh, the company. So if you're on an interview, figure out what the company does on the back end, be prepared for it. And if they use an AWS, if they use an Azure, at least you can narrow down a little bit in regards to what type of, I guess if you want to call them appliances or features that might be using from that, uh, that cloud service provider solution. So it wouldn't be fair for them to ask you questions that are very particular to let's say, uh, you know, the Oracle cloud, if it's supposed to be in regards to AWS, right? So. 
make sense. Would the certifications uh, that are equivalent to your interests and be sp specialized for it? Muhammad, I honestly don't understand what you're actually asking. Do either of you guys? I am not sure. I'm going to take a, a guess at this. And Muhammad, if, if I'm if I didn't understand it correctly, write it in the chat. I'm not a a huge believer in trying to find a certification that aligns with my interest and that just happens to align with the company. Because I tell you this, you can fall in love with the tech. And generally speaking, you fall in love with the technology or solution because you understand it and you're good at it. So it's a little bit biased. But at the end of the day, you're in this to provide for yourself and provide for your family. So what you might find very interesting may not be the most financially viable, you know, course to take. Let's just be honest. That that's how the world, you know, the world kind of works. I mean, breathing is important, but <laughs> money kind of is up there with breathing. So I, I would definitely say go for what makes money, but if you can match your interest with it and it does some good for people. That is fantastic. Would I necessarily hang my hat on it and say that it needs to be that way? I wouldn't. Because your life, you're always going to be doing things you don't necessarily like that you're going to feel uncomfortable with. And work is not going to be any different. Even if you try to be a cloud architect or an architect in general, you might find that there's aspects of that particular vocation that you love doing and that other things might just be a drag. Simple example would be, you might enjoy, you know, taking out your customers, talking to them, engaging them, being social with them and gathering the information, but actually putting together the documentation and writing, you're not going to take much pleasure in that perhaps, right? Yeah. So again, if you can marry them, great. If not, don't worry so much about it. Just do what you need to, to be able to support yourself and your family and hopefully still be, uh, be able to provide excellent service to your customers. Great, great response, great Mark. Response. First name, last name. What certification goes well with your AI architect program? You know, so David and I discussed this very heavily. And, you know, David's perspective is there's no certification that teaches AI architecture or architecture of any kind. Yeah. And my perception is kind of the same thing. Here's what certifications I would recommend. A lot of the AI is going to be done on the cloud. So maybe an Azure Solutions Architect expert or an AWS Solutions Architect expert. I'd probably get the Azure Solutions Architect expert because let's face it, Azure has the lead in AI overall with Google as close second and AWS a distant third. But again, there's no best technology. It's going to be the one that on, that opt, it's best optimized for the business and its use cases. So you know, just because one's cooler on paper doesn't mean that they're all not going to be equal based upon the customer's needs. So I would say a cloud provider professional, which again covers nothing related to architecture, but at least it's good for your brand. I would say a TOGAF, because while AWS say, well, architecture framework is how do you build it or how do you design AWS stuff and make the AWS stuff work? TOGAF is basically a framework for how would you design it? Meaning how would you start with the uh, clients, assess their vision, evaluate their business processes, think about their data, think about their technology. Now, it doesn't teach you any of these things, but it at least it's a framework. Then maybe go in and, and talk about how to governance and solutions and change management. At least it's going to get you thinking like an architect. So I would say those two. But really, it's about getting your business acumen, getting your leadership, getting your executive presence, learning all those AI things from AI model training to uh, you know, AI model building, and we don't mean hands-on building, to uh, your data, your data hygiene practices, and everything else that goes into generating generative AI, and how to secure it, the ethics, and all these other things. So not a certification thing here. This is a knowledge thing. Hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, I, I, just before we move on to the next, I was going to say, I, I think the AI aspect is going to be years in the future where mm. any potential certification might be able to match it. Yeah, I yeah. would definitely 
and you guys give me your opinion what you think I, I look at it very similar to how every certification kind of has gone through a life cycle where i also believe the cloud certifications that right now is very hairy on the implementation side it's going to take years to mature and eventually get to a point where uh, enough use cases have been done enough pain and suffering has been inflicted <laughs> I <couldn't laughs> for designs uh for there to be any sliver of a chance to have a certification or a again outside of what we're doing here and what david and mike did where you'll have a little bit more of a design slash architecture focused program so mm. i like Mike, I would definitely say if you don't see a clear path of being able to pad out a particular set of needed knowledge with certification, look for skills-based training and predominantly always focus on these things that we might call intangibles, which is going to be your communication skills. Always learn more about the business, presenting yes. in the selling aspect, things that make you stand out from the everyday even architect or engineer that you might come across. So that will be where I would focus on if I can't marry a certification to a particular, yeah. you know, career. I, I don't know what you think about that, Alonzo, too. I, I agree. Um, like you said, there's just like cloud um, and there's so many overlaps between when people got into the cloud space as well as the uh, AI space. People are trying to understand how to best use it. What is it? How can we apply these applications? on a consistent level, what is the overlying consistency across all uh, industries? What is compliance? What is governance? How is this going to meet our needs across domestic as well as international markets? Uh, EU, their rules are gonna be different than our rules and so forth. And what is gonna be that overall framework? So I, I, it would be interesting and I dare say that they might even come up with a AI framework similar to TOGAF to meet these needs in the, um, in the mid future or so. So until they're able to understand and get a solid grasp on that, it's like grabbing air. How do I draw air? You know, so getting the overall foundations of what cloud architecture is, how to meet business need, how to communicate uh, what ideas and solutions are, how to meet the customer where they are and be able to ask the questions about the questions within the questions that will be your foundation moving forward and then start streamlining becoming a a a not subject matter expert of ai until we're able to better frame it but start putting some emphasis on what it is learning about large language models gans baes auto regression um, how does it all come together and then your value as a, a uh, uh, entity will start coming into focus um, and providing value for organizations. Absolutely. If you've got some questions, please ask them. And there's another good one from Back to Basics that, you know, it's the, diff it's the exact difference between architect thinking and engineering thinking and certification thinking versus actually what we do on the job. It's pretty important, so we should pop it up there. It's about the how about in the case, Tyrone. How about in the case of business using legacy, um, but wanting to transfer to the cloud? I'm assuming that uh, they want to move out of legacy into the cloud. What is that case looking like, Mike? So Mark? back to basics, we have to understand it. First, there's no such thing as legacy. And here's what I mean by this. There's very old technologies. Did you know back to basics that mainframe spending is going up? <laughs> you know, these mainframes from 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 years ago. And do you know why they're going up? Because they all went to the cloud as part of the mainframe modernization. The cloud was more expensive, it performed worse, and it didn't do as good of a job as the mainframe. So people are going back to the mainframe from cloud computing. Now, let's talk about cloud repatriation and why we told everybody that was going to occur and why it creates more jobs for cloud architects. All the cloud is back to basics is somebody else's network in a data center. That's it. So it's the same thing that we always had, just performs less slower and it's more expensive, albeit more scalable. So in our data center, legacy technology is a virtual machine invented by VMware in 1999. In the cloud, what do we get from AWS and EC2 instance and Azure virtual machine and Google compute engine instance? It's the same tech. Now, how about this new and exciting object storage thing, right? That's 25 to 30 years as well. 
We didn't call it S3 or cloud storage or blob on Microsoft. We called it object storage. It's the same technology. Now, how about that new super exciting thing on AWS last year where every architect had to talk about how great it was, that you could have a direct connection to AWS and run IPsec on it. Wow, exciting. Cisco did that in 1998. So I don't know what legacy is. The cloud's all legacy technology. I've been working with different clouds since 1993. ISDN clouds, frame relay clouds, ATM clouds, VPLS clouds, BGP clouds. It's just all various versions of the same thing. So back to basics, it all goes back to the same thing. What is the business goal? What is the business trying to achieve? What are the business's pain points? If I'm dealing with a bank that's got an incredible number of high volume transactions, guess what? They're probably gonna be better off with a mainframe than the cloud. They probably are. If I'm dealing with an organization that needs maximum security and maximum performance, I'm gonna have better performance in the legacy environment, meaning our data center, where I can have multiple 100 gig links over 50 meters or less, than trying to have a 10 gig link to a cloud provider that's 1500 kilometers away. So there's that. Now, what if the technology I have works great, but I just need new business processes? That's fine too. So it's all about what's, what's the business goals? What's the vision for that business? Is that business trying to do some new AI thing? Does that business currently have good databases, good data hygiene, good storage performance, good network performance? If so, probably gonna be cheaper to do that AI in the data center. Now, what if that organization has an old and dilapidated data center and they lack the technical capabilities and they lack their infrastructure architects and engineers, and they're in a part of the world where it's hard to get strong infrastructure engineers? Well, in that organization, if I have a less technically sophisticated organization, it may make sense to rent that data center in the form of going to AWS, Azure, or Google. Or maybe it's cheapest and best performance to create a Nutanix or an OpenStack data center and connect them to AWS for, for what they call it, cloud bursting, or when you run out of capacity in your data center, add the rest to AWS, and I back up to Google. So there is no such thing as legacy. We think of older technology as legacy, but sometimes it's still the correct technology. Yeah, And that's what we really need to think about. What is in the best interest of our clients? Where we go wrong and why most cloud architectures are complete disasters, most of them, is people are like, whoa, we got this monolithic application. Yeah, it's working great for us, but it's new and exciting to go to microservices. And then they go to microservices and then they find that, it, that it's more complex and it costs them 10 times more. Maybe that wasn't the right decision for them. Maybe that monolith was fine. So it's all about what problems are we trying to solve. The tech is just a tool. You know, there's people that build houses. Some of them use hammers, some of them use nail guns. I don't care. Some of them use one kind of cement versus another kind of cement. When you design a building that's gonna be a thousand meters tall, it's not what building technology you use. It's will the building hold the strength? Can the ground support the weight of the building? Can the, can the building handle the wind forces and say a hurricane or an earthquake? You know, what, what does it take to get power a thousand meters without losing some of the power and power attenuation of the cables? These are all the kind of things that are there, the planning. It has nothing to do with the technology itself. That's the last thing we think about. I, I wanted to add to this. Yeah. When we generally speak legacy, and again, for those that know, I come from a managed service provider background. So we threw these terms around like, you know, people change socks when it comes to the term legacy. But generally speaking, there's two types of situations where we use this term legacy. One of them is to bring out that a particular solution or technology is older, but very well established and thoroughly tested. That's generally what I hear people refer to as legacy. Then you have those that are trying to sell you the new kid on the block, so to speak, and they use the term legacy in a way mm. to diminish a previous technology, not actually knowing that even this new kid on the block is really using the quote unquote legacy technology as a way to work, right? Uh, if we look at a very simple uh, example with software defined networking, that's been the latest craze. Now we're moving into cloud, eventually, you know, SASE. And yet they all run on what? TCP IP. Yep. They run on routers, firewalls, switches. 
if these are so old, if they're so bad, why, why is this still the, the infrastructure of the solution? So just because something is old doesn't make it necessarily bad. And that's why we also have addendum to technologies, right? If you look at just something like IPv6, probably also, I think like 20 years old, if at least like 19 something it was came out. Yeah. And yet look how many addendums there are to IPv6, that particular protocol on regards to how IPv6 should work with it, what kind of link local addressing there is. So from that perspective, legacy also gets updated. So in my book, legacy means it's well established. It's been thoroughly tested. And even if a company is like you mentioned back to basic 200 years old, the, if the processes work for the company, then what is bad with that? If they make money, the customers are happy, uh, you know, there might be instances why they might want to re-architect certain aspects. Maybe they want to be more efficient, save more money. That's fair enough, but I would say if it ain't broken, hasn't been broken for 200 years, why fix it? That's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I I'm agree. 200 years old. So. <laughs> I mean, you think about it like everyone, the, the name of the game is fear of missing out. Everyone yep. wants the latest and greatest, but they don't know how to add it in. Um, look at it this way. You know, when it, it doesn't fit the business, you know, the business is the house. You, bring, you buy a brand new luxury um, SUV, extended cab but it doesn't fit in the garage. Do you build extra garage around the technology or did you just miscalculate and not buy the right uh, vehicle for the house that makes sense? So you have to really start thinking about why the technology needs to be integrated. Is it meeting the business? Is it providing extra security? Is it giving them extra uh, uh, market share for their business? Is it providing an extra layer of uh, improved workflow processes for the interior? in a user experience for the exterior for customers. What is this about? So making sure that you choose the right uh, 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 technology or if it, like it ain't if it ain't broke, don't fix it, fix yep. it. Leave it alone and continue to build upon what you already have. And if necessary, change, uh, deprecate that system or replace it with something else, you know, but make sure it's about the business and not about the technology. And, and that's why you generally have these round uh, round table discussions too, right? You have different perspectives of things right. just like we had today so that you can make a decision that's appropriate. Because I've never ever been in, you know, working on a project or anything where it's just been me or come up with my own ideas of how it should be. Yeah. I would try to get the take of everybody from different opinions, different perspectives, so that we can make sure we cover our bases and deliver something that is going to be useful to the customer. Right. Yeah. And that has to come from different perspectives. It has to come from the tech side, has to come also to for the customer. Does it work for them? You'll have to talk to the CEO, their their brand manager, their CTO and so forth. So there's a wide breadth, you might say, of people that need to be included in coming up with a good solution. It, it's funny how, you know, if you want to create a solution and you draw it out, and you only have one perspective on that, mm -hmm. that flat dimension versus bringing it to life requires a three-dimensional perspective, and that's looking at from all angles. So considering that type of analogy is how things come to life, how things work, yeah. because we're looking at it from Mark's perspective, Mike's perspective, including my own, to see how this thing is feasible or not. No. There's wisdom and many counselors, as they say. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> In theory. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dominic, one, two, three. Aside from networking and security, what other areas can cloud architects specialize in? Okay, Mr. Dominic, we're going to talk about the first specialty, which is the one that no one wants to specialize in, and it's the one that pays the most. And it can pay you $300,000 to $700,000 more than focusing on tech, being a great business executive mm -hmm. and opening yourself up to the $800,000 to the $1.2 million chief architect roles. This is an architect that has very good business skills, is an extreme executive, is an extremely good leader. They like me and they do the billion dollar plus architectures. They do business process re-engineering. We build teams of 30 to 50 architects at a time. We speak at conferences. We're in the media, constantly in the media, talking about the future of technology and how it can optimize business. Think someone like me or someone like a David Lithicum. That's the specialty, optimizing business. And in that, you know, we have our, our vertical industry architects. So 
Mr. Dominic, I used to practice internal medicine. So for a couple of years there, I focused as a technology strategist and an architect in the healthcare world. That was the best use of my business acumen and my industry experience. I know other architects that are experts at banking and they design solutions for banking clients. So that's the best one, being the business. Probably second best right now is gonna be an AI architect, like a cloud architect with a AI background. Why? AI is probably the, the most disruptive technology of our time since internet protocol. And since the internet, AI is probably gonna be the thing that changes it the most. So an AI architect is gonna be the biggest in demand and they're gonna be the shortest in supply other than the business executives. So that's probably gonna be your next pick. Yeah, after that, I would say the security architect, why? We've got security threats going from every part of the world. Sadly, we're relatively close to World War III. We've got half of the world on fire at war with each other. We've got state actors as well as hackers, crackers, and everywhere in between. And there's a definition of a difference between a hacker and a cracker if you get real specific on it. But, you know, the point is, you know, cyber threats are there. Now let's look at it this way. Now, all this cloud repatriation and hybrid multi-cloud stuff is increasing the need for networking people, so the network architects are there. Also, big data architects, which is not exactly an AI architect. People that orchestrate big data is another place where you could focus your time. Quite frankly, there's an application architect that can be deploying, designing applications for the cloud, and that's another place where people are starting thinking. So pretty much you can be in any one of these roles, but I recommend focusing more on the business by focusing more on strategy because at the end of the day, very few architects actually understand business. And if you do, you're a true solution provider, not just someone that's gonna drive tech and you know have 70% of all tech projects go. Good question. I, I saw an interesting meme today, uh, just to kind of throw it out there. It says like, how do you know if that person is an architect slash designer? They answer every question with it depends. So same here, Mr. Dominic, it, it depends. What are, you, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying what's, to maximize your earning potential? What's the why? Or are you, I'm sorry? I said, what's the why? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, what are you trying to do, right? If you're trying to maximize your earning potential, focus on the business. That's been a proven uh, track on earning the most money because you're at the ground floor of impacting the income of a company. And depending what company you're within, uh, that might be, uh, you know, quite a, a few millions of billions, so to say, right? So your compensation package might look uh, quite generous in that sense. If you're looking to be more on the technology side, your earning potential is going to be capped more since you're going to be less business, more technology. But on the flip side, you will have plenty to pick from. You know, I mean, think about it. You can look at what does a data center itself have? You know, we mentioned only a few. Networking is always going to be there. Security yep. is always going to be there. They're going to kind of interwind between everything. Uh, if you want to be an impact, a uh, person that's impactful when it comes to Gen AI or just the, you know, cloud in general, guess what? Storage. Yep. I mean, storage is such a huge field that you can specialize in, mm -hmm. which is going to overlap in regards to networking, right? If you think fiber channel over Ethernet, for example, uh, how do you pair that with security, right? So there's a lot of just those aspects with uh, storage. Uh, one of the big ones that I can think of is virtualization, both yep. from a server perspective, a workload perspective, and then there's a huge demand for uh, network virtualization as well, because we need yep. that. That's how a lot of this uh, serverless and just in general, the cloud kind of functions is based on network virtualization. Yep. So it, it really just depends on what you're trying to do. Maximize your money, go for business. You wanna be a little bit uh, more techy, there's plenty of other ones. I would say go for virtualization. Let's say you don't want to do networking security, do virtualization and impacts the most or specialize in storage. Can't go wrong there either. Let me go to the next one, Tyrone. Mark Chester. Can you get hired as an enterprise architect in your program if you only have four years of work experience as a project coordinator with no MBA degree or with the AI program be a better fit? So Mark, you can get an architect job regardless of your background. I can think about Jermaine Helfton. He was selling landscaping gear before he came to us. A year later, he's working as an enterprise architect at Southern New Hampshire University. 
I can think of Wallace Agana. Wallace Agana came to us. He was a sales rep. He got his first job at JP Morgan Chase as an enterprise architect with no tech background. First tech job ever. Now, I will tell you it's easier to get a cloud architect job without experience, and I'll give you some examples. I think of Ivan Tamba, who was 20 some years old. He was a college student working as a waiter when he went through our program hired by AWS. Or Jordan uh, Kitkill, Katil uh, from Cameroon, really nice kid. He was actually friends with Ivan Tamba in Cameroon before they came to America together. And he got hired by AWS as a solution architect with uh, no tech experience. He just got promoted to senior solutions architect. I'm real proud of him. I saw him at the conference. Uh, I can think of, for example, Jeffrey West, who was doing some kind of really cool geospatial imaging thing. Nothing to do with tech, but it was really cool. And he got his first job at Kaolin as a solution architect after our training. I can think of Lenny Burnett, who was a video editor, our video editor, and a rock star in every way, shape, or form. It got hired by our electronics after our training. I can think of Delroy Bad, who was working on ambulances and got hired by AWS. I'm sorry, not by CDW as a security architect. I can think of Daniel Bosa, who we trained. He was 20 years old and dropped out of high school, didn't finish high school, and JP Morgan Chase hired him as a solution architect. Or Jennifer Ema, who was a mental health tech by JP Morgan Chase. Or Balwinder Kerr, who was a stay at home mom who was hired by Microsoft. So the key is you got to be great, Mark, Mac. Now, I will tell you, it's going to be easier to get a cloud architect job without experience than an enterprise architect job. But, you know, you got to pick the role you want. And if you were to take our enterprise architect program, it's also going to cover all those cloud architecture things as well. So you're going to be able to be prepared for both. So, you know, I think you'll get it. Or actually, you should be able to get anything you want. You stay. People stay on our programs until the day they're hired. We don't have like an end date to our program. We let people stay in the main in the main program until they are hired. You get a year of live classes. So as long as you do the training and as long as you don't quit on you, you should have a great enterprise architect career. But pick the one that you love most. Mm -hmm. I, I love the enterprise architect world most because I'm more of a business executive. I still love that network architect career because you know I like to get <laughs> geeky in networking and I probably let it slip out today exactly how geeky I like to get in networking. Of course, networking and data center is the whole cloud, but you know, you gotta do what you love. And you, but yeah. you, yes, you can do great after our program. Yeah, I couldn't say it better. Just focus on what you love, get competent at it, and we can definitely help you get there. One of the great things about our program is that not only do we help you hone in on what you're, what you love to do, but provide some milestones, a time frame of how you want to get there, what you want to focus on, cloud security, cloud networking, AI, and so forth and be able to help you hone in on those specific certifications that will be valuable on top of your competency. So yeah, give us a, uh, give a, reach out to us, uh, Mac, set up a video conference. You'll have an opportunity to speak with us and let's get you going in your uh, preferred development program. Yeah. Joseph, how does AI make its artificial intelligence? Is AI an appliance or a program which makes decisions on its own without human intervention? Joseph, uh, here's the good news. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have Tyrone pop in a couple of videos in the chat box that talks about what is generative AI, how does AI work, the components of it, whether they be large language model models or compute, for example. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Generally speaking, at a super high level, what has to occur is the primary piece of generative AI or AI in general is your data. The good, we have to have the right kind of data and we use the data to train a model. Now the model will determine, you know, how we analyze that data. The model will take that data, learn from the data and be able to respond to the data. But there's a lot of components that go into this about the model building, the model training. And unfortunately, it's not a 60 second question to answer, but um, we, I'm having my team post a couple of videos that I did with David Lithicum. David Lithicum has been working with AI systems since the 1980s. He created a system in the 80s, which landed him a job in NASA in AI architecture. Of course, he was a chief technology officer and the head of Deloitte's cloud strategy and has been working on AI in every project for probably the last few decades. So. You know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. AI is not new. 
the generative AI things are on the newer side, but AI is, you know, 30, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. And we've got a couple of videos that are going to get down and dirty that, that at least explain the main components. And honestly, there's a free preview of the our generative AI architect program on our website. And if you want to do that, my team will pop a link to that. You, it's a free preview. And that'll talk about all the components that actually go into this as a generative AI architect that we actually cover, which are the main components. So did I answer all the... Uh, OK, let's get to the last questions first. Uh, my uh, question basically is that is that you're submitting uh, uh, skills are actually the key to being a strong architect. Would you agree? And this eloquent, is for students, yeah. Eloquent competency is the key skills. Now, let's say you were going to go to a doctor, and they went to Oxford University for the bachelor's degree. They went to Harvard University Medical School, and then after that, they did a rotation at Duke University for a fellowship and the residency. They look great on paper, right? Now, what if every patient that went to that doctor died? Would you go to that doctor? The answer is, I hope not. The, the degrees or the certifications, they're just something that hangs on the wall. Your actual ability to do the job and do it well, which is related to your skills, is really all that matters. You know, it used to be that degrees were mandatory for any professional job. But if I told you that IBM, Google, Microsoft and pretty much and pretty much anybody who's anybody dropped the degree requirements mm -hmm. in the last 12 months. And why is that? It's not that degrees are bad. The degrees are teaching things that are today's world that are almost unrelated to any professional job. They're more about ideas and theories and ideations about political views than actually teaching people their career. Employers need people that actually can do their career. So all of a sudden, the value of formal education has gone down which is great from my perspective, even though I have lots of master's degrees, because you know it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to get these kinds of education. And if it's not providing the value, I'd rather people get something that is. Spend less time in school, don't waste four years, or five years, or six years, or seven years for each degree like I did. Maybe learn a year or two and really focus hard on being able to do anything. It removes barriers, it removes cost, and it gives everybody a fair shot at the world. So skills are the, are the secret to any career. Hard and soft skills. Okay, so we are out of questions. Let me invite we're invite you to a few things. Join us on Thursday on the How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. It's free. My team will pop the link of it in the chat box and the description of this video. We'll talk for about the role for about 30 minutes. After that, we'll be on Zoom for 90 minutes. You can ask questions, want to see if you're ready for a job. We'll mini interview you if you want. I don't care. Ask your questions. We'll answer them. And we can have a face-to-face -face conversation because it takes a lot of good information to be able to find any kind of And it's free. We also have a guide on how to get your first AI architect job or how to get and how to get your first cloud architect job, why tech skills are not enough, how to win the interview. And it's all free. All these free ebooks are in the description of this video. So go get them. And then, and then, honestly, uh, I'll be back tomorrow to answer career questions from two to four on YouTube. I love helping people get hired. I love when people get raises, and we've got students and people all over the world, and I just love it. So, you know, come join us for some of these free events, and I hope to see you soon. Uh, anything from you, Alonzo or Mark, before we go? Well, I, I got to say, it's always great working with you, gentlemen. Even though we, uh, uh, we're working hard to always develop programs, I'm always trying to learn more CCIE-related networking from these two gentlemen. We're always learning. Even if we're in the uh, faces of this organization or not, we're still trying to get better. Because when we get better and iron sharpens iron against these gentlemen, you get better. So continue to grow. Continue to learn. Please tune in with us at YouTube. Tune in with us on LinkedIn. Get the best of you, best information you can about becoming a cloud architect, and we're always ready to help you all. Hope you enjoyed this discussion on AWS versus Azure versus GCP certifications. What's missing that you need to know? Take care. See you soon. Take care, everyone. Take care, all.